Kaka, my power is unmatched. Hello folks, Phil Gallagher, aka Thraben, you here for another legacy video. And we've had four days of early access Modern Horizons gameplay this week. And now I want to top it off with kind of some analysis now that I have some time to breathe and record. Um, look behind the curtain here for a minute. Uh, I started recording at noon on Friday and I stopped working at about 10.30 p.m. I was having a friend come into town, so Friday was the, oh, I have to get everything done that I possibly want to do for next week with this content. Uh, so I had a very, very, very long day. But uh, hopefully the content has been great. And now that I have some time, we're going to record some actual thoughts and analysis of the gameplay and kind of talk about how I think Legacy is going to change moving forward. I'm going to focus on the cards that I have seen in action. There are a lot of things that are potentially good, uh, such as Psychic Frog, that I just have not seen in play, and I'd prefer to wait and talk about those until I have actually seen them in action. So if you want to talk about stuff that's not in this video, um, maybe hit up the Discord and I'll be happy to chat there. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the stuff that I have hands-on experience with and can talk from experience. Now that's going to be limited experience for many of these, but I think it is still going to be useful. Should you find that you need any of these cards from Modern Horizons, and you probably will, consider checking out my sponsor, toamagic.com. That's Tales of Adventure. You get free shipping on your order, and they tend to have 95% of standard legal things in stock, as well as a bunch of really sweet old cards like Dual Land. So consider checking them out, and if you are doing a local event, or sorry, not a local event, a larger regional event or something like that, there's a good chance that you can order online and pick up on site. And let me also say that today's video is sponsored by Moxfield.com, and all of my Modern Horizons 3 deck lists from this week are available on my personal Moxfield profile. So check out ThrabenU on there, and I'll be linking to one CEDH list, actually, in today's video description. So without further ado, let's get into it, and let's start with the bird. So Nadu was a card that I was pretty hot on in spoiler season. And now that I've seen it in action, I think that I actually underestimated it, even though I already thought that it was going to be very good. I think that this is potentially a format-defining card in a couple of different formats. And I think CEDH is one of those formats. There were a couple of large CEDH events over the weekend. I believe there was a, an SCG 8K, and I think the one at Charlie's Collectible Show in Atlanta was a 10K. Uh, one of those events had three Nadu players in the final four players. And this is the first week that the cards are legal. Like, I think literally the day that the cards, or maybe the day after it was possible to obtain the cards, Nadu already had that degree of success. So, just keep an eye on this one. I have also seen some modern deck lists around this card that also look quite powerful. But most of you probably care the most about legacy, so let's shift our attention there for a moment. I think the biggest question with Nadu is, how do you build this decklist? When I played against Brian, his decklist was essentially a stone blade decklist that had sort of a mid-range combo finish and used Nadu for a lot of value. You know, if you have Nadu and you activate a Shuko or another free thing a bunch of times, and you go and you refill your hand with counterspells and interaction, you probably don't lose, especially if you then get to just lethal your opponent with Field of the Dead on the following turn. Brian built a mid-range control deck around Nadu, but that's not the way that, for example, the CEDH lists are really going. They are closer to a combo control deck. And I think it is just as easy to build a deck that is four Shukos, four Nadus, and a handful of protection spells and ways to tutor four combo pieces 
rather than being a mid-range deck first, you are a combo deck first. And the question is going to be, how do you build it? Which one of those is more optimal? And I think it is going to take time to find the answer to that. You know, we, we have a completely unknown metagame right now. You know, the whole Grief Reanimate thing is still going to be a huge portion of Legacy, but all of the brewing around the edges of the format, you know, has been blown wide open and there's a ton of viable new strategies. So where exactly on the spectrum you want to be on any given week might vary a little bit. And I think a good comparison here is to think about how Doomsday lists have looked over the past four or five years, where sometimes they are much more mid-range with things like Teferi and Baleful Strix in them, whereas other times, you know, it is personal tutor, we are trying to go fast, I also have Cabal Rituals as extra uh, acceleration. We, we might end up somewhere kind of like that, where this is a deck that shifts a little bit from week to week. And one of the other conceptual questions I have moving forward is whether or not Cephalid Breakfast, that is Cephalid Illusionist, uh, Shuko combo, slots Nadu in, or whether Nadu is a completely separate deck. I, I think, I think Nadu is just a separate deck because it wants you to have some different things than the Cephalid Illusionist combo deck does. But it's possible that, you know, Nadu being another piece of an A plus B combo where both of those things use Shuko is just good enough. But, you know, requiring Narc Amoeba versus requiring some sort of Field of the Dead type stuff puts you into different territory. And I, I think shoving these together into one deck ends up with you having kind of a clunky deck that has too many awkward draws. But again, we'll see. So I was talking with a gold saber tooth a bit this morning, who is an absolutely awesome artist, and I'll be linking their CEDH deck list uh, down in the video description. And uh, follow them on Twitter if you want to see some really cool uh, magic art. Uh, they they do a lot of really awesome uh, play mats and tokens and stuff. Uh, and you might have seen him at a sorted magic events already. Um. Anyways, I was thumbing through his deck list. And Skew Squirm was something that I saw that was pretty cool. Uh, landfall abilities are obviously very good with Nadu. And landfall abilities that specifically produce extra bodies that you can then, you know, move your Shuko over to to trigger Nadu two more times results in a very easy way to keep continuing that loop. And Field of the Dead accomplishes a very similar thing while being a land slot itself. And Skewt Swarm might be a little too slow for Legacy, and it's an X1 body, which isn't the best in a Orcish Bowmaster world. But, you know, it is always a good idea to respect tech from other formats, and just brewers just kind of passively be thinking about this. And you can go pretty deep in terms of the Nadu technology. Sea King's Blessing, for example is a way to target every single creature that you control and do a whole bunch of Nadu triggers all at the same time, uh, which is pretty cute. So when I originally evaluated Nadu, I thought it was a very good card, and in reality it might actually just be one of the better cards in the set. I expect to see a decent amount of this in Legacy moving forward, because even when you are not triggering Nadu's ability, it is still a 3-4 flying body for 3 mana. And when we think about threats in the format, you know, you think about your Dragon's Rage Channelers, you think about your Delver of Secrets, you think about your Orcish Bowmasters. Minus the things that have something like Menace or Shadow, Nadu blocks a ton of the early game threats, going to be things like Merktide Regents and Urza Saga tokens that are going to be larger than it, but those are kind of slow going. So if you do something like Noble Hierarch into Nadu, you are actually just, in addition to threatening a combo finish incredibly quickly, you are also stonewalling opposing threats. And even if your opponent has a removal spell, you know, say a Swords to Plowshares to remove Nadu, Nadu's ability is going to trigger at least once 
immediately replacing itself. So it is very hard for Nadu to not be at least a two for one. And that is a very good sign. I don't think we're quite at an Oko level of territory here, but this is very clearly the next broken Simic card. All right, now let's talk about Vexing Bobble. This was originally one of my picks for the best card in the set, and now that I've seen it in action, I think it is only incredibly good. Um, I don't know that it's the best card from the set anymore. So conceptually, Urza Saga into Ancient Tomb has always been an incredibly powerful legacy start. But now that start is even better because it can lead into you playing around free counter spells for the rest of the game. And that is incredibly strong. But notice my wording there is not that you are playing around counter spells for the rest of the game. You are playing around free counter spells for the rest of the game. Vexing Bobble only counter stuff if a player spent no mana to cast that spell. Meaning, your opponent can still 2 mana daze you, 5 mana force of will you, 3 mana force of negation you. It does not permanently shut off those counter spells, it just turns them into quite bad cards. They are going to be below format power level. And if your opponent is spending all of their mana kind of holding up their counter spells rather than progressing their own plan, your Urza Saga tokens are probably beating them to death and like life is good. I don't quite think, after seeing it in action, that Vexing Bobble is just an I win button versus combo. It's very powerful, but one of the things that we saw is that we saw Bryant cast Beseech the Mirror for Tendrils, cast Tendrils off Beseech, spending zero mana, but the Storm copies still went through, right? As they are placed on the stack, they are not cast. So Vexing Bobble stopped all the artifact mana. It stopped, uh, you know, the, the Gaia's Will recursion lines. But I should say stopped all the artifact mana. But it didn't, didn't stop the rituals that got him to Beseech the Mirror. It did not stop him from casting the artifact mana to build Storm Count. Vexing Bobble feels like an incredibly powerful but beatable card. And this is something that we are probably going to see main decked in every single Urza Saga deck, even the ones that, you know, there is some deck building tension there. And there might be some decks that play this as a four of in the main deck or a four of in the sideboard or something like that. The fact that it also cantrips is incredibly, incredibly powerful. In terms of power level, I think this card is an Orcish Bowmasters. And by that, I mean, I think this is an incredibly powerful card that is going to twist and warp gameplay patterns. But ultimately, I don't think that this is something that is going to be unhealthy for the format. But I do want to put a little asterisk there in that I think this card might actually be best when it is defensively used in a combo deck that does not care about the Vexing Bobble downside. So for example, consider that you are a combo deck that just goes turn one Vexing Bobble, turn two go off, now Force of Will, Force of Negation, Days, all that stuff is just not online. That feels incredibly powerful. I am not exactly sure what combo deck that is or what that looks like. But that is something that is kind of mentally on my radar after playing with this. Like, I think this is incredible in an Urza Saga shell. It's very possible that some Hate Bears style deck plays this as something that can help bridge them uh, to two mana and beyond where their more powerful plays start coming online. But I'm definitely scared of the defensive Vexing Bobble. So in short, incredibly powerful card. Format changing for sure but maybe not the ultimate boogeyman that I thought it was going to be. Okay, let's talk about White Orchid Phantom. I, I lived the dream with this card in one of the matches that I played, where I ambushed a Delver, sinkholed a land, and then Brian did not have a basic land to search out. And that was, that was a moment that 
sparked joy in my cold, dead heart, and it made me want to play a bunch of Death and Taxes again. And I think that sort of thing is the pinnacle of what this card is capable of. And we saw Brian immediately concede once I had the ability to blink it with Felia. Um, just as a quick passing note about Felia here, uh, Felia conceptually seems powerful. The three that I tested was probably too many. I didn't get to see it in action very much. Um, this is one of those, I, I need to reserve my judgment until I have more data. I conceptually like this card a lot, though. So this section is actually really targeted at mono black players, oddly enough. Sinkhole is a card that is very beloved on this channel by so, so many of my viewers. It represents this older nostalgic era of magic where you really de denied resources, you know, you attack the hand, you attack the lands, and you won eventually. White Orchid Phantom kind of seems like the power corrupt version of Sinkhole. Like, obviously the cards are different, but within the confines of Legacy, sometimes this is just Sinkhole on a 2-2 flying first strike in different colors, but in colors where blink blinking and reusing your creatures is perfectly reasonable. And I think those of you that really like those land destruction strategies are really going to enjoy playing with this. We are also moving into a metagame where the Cloudpost style decks, the Tron style decks that potentially want to go very big with their mana are potentially going to become more popular, at least at the beginning of this metagame while people are brewing with them and seeing like, hey, do these strategies actually hang in the Wasteland format still? Uh, this is probably a very good card to be playing in the short term. But notably, you know, it's white, white cost is going to mean that playing too many colorless or pseudo colorless utility lands is going to be a good thing, or sorry, a bad thing. So your Rashadden ports, your Cavern of Souls that don't make true white mana are probably going to be pretty rough if you are playing them alongside this card. So just kind of be aware of that when you are doing your deck building. You know, you're obviously going to want to play Wasteland, and maybe it's not crazy to play some number of Ghost Quarters if you're on a Yorian build alongside this, but I would be very cautious with going too hard on Utility Lands if you want a white, white card to be a on-curve two-drop play. All right, next up is six. I was pretty mid on this card, and then I played it, and one of the things that I conceptually did not realize immediately was that you could use the retrace ability multiple times in a turn. So if you have a handful of lands from something like a Life from the Loam, you know, you can discard a land, cast a Stoneforge Mystic, discard another land, cast something else from your graveyard, and that is conceptually something that is very powerful. The 2-4 reach body maybe doesn't kill some things in combat, but it is going to block a lot of stuff. This card might be a little bit better than I initially thought it was. I was kind of uh, mediocre on it on the podcast. I thought it was worth talking about. And I still don't really know if this card has a home but I expect some of the like Maverick, Four Color Loam type decks to quite enjoy this card. Since pre-war formalware is not on Magic Online, I have never played with or against this card. So I imagine Six is kind of competing conceptually with pre-war formalware. And if you are a White Orchid Phantom enjoyer, these sorts of effects that can recur it from the graveyard after your opponent gets rid of it seem pretty appealing. All right, let's talk about Harbinger of the Seas now. When I played my game, my games were already won or lost before I got to three mana, and my games against Bryant were defined by Actually, the Thorn of Amethysts that were in my main deck and the Null Rods that were in my sideboard. I think that a lot of what I have to say about White Orchid Phantom applies here. 
in that if the metagame shifts and we start seeing more of these big mana decks, a deck that has the ability to main deck four copies of a Blood Moon that is attached to a creature is, is conceptually an okay place to be. And I don't expect these greedy up the bean stock decks that are three to five colors to disappear in any capacity. So this is probably a fine card moving forward. You know, the question you just have to ask yourself is like, am I willing to submit Merfolk as a deck that I want to play seriously in Legacy? And for me, that answer is no. And then someone is going to say like, ah, fuck you, Phil, here's 50 bucks. You know, you're playing Merfolk in a league and I'm going to go like, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm being more genuine for a second. I think outside of Legacy, maybe in something like Modern, Harbinger of the Seas might be quite good. But you get to do a lot of really powerful stuff in Legacy, and I'd prefer to be doing those powerful things. And speaking of powerful things, Planar Nexus very much impressed me in my initial testing. And I, I think to explain why... We need to talk about Ancient Tomb for a second. Ancient Tomb is a card that I love, but Ancient Tomb is not actually that good of a magic card. And uh, this might be a little bit blasphemous, but uh, bear with me for a minute. When you first start playing magic, you go, I need to protect my life points no matter what, because I lose when they're gone. And when you get a little bit better at magic, you realize that your life total is a resource. And you can give up some points of life in order to progress your game. And that's why so many black cards, uh, like a sign in blood effect, let you pay some life to draw some cards. Or maybe Necrodominance from the new set here. Ancient Tomb is something that is great the first couple of times that you use it. But when you are getting beaten to death by a 3-3 flyer, or, you know, Karanos forbid, a 7-7 Merktide region or something like that, Ancient Tomb very quickly has a strong downside. An Ancient Tomb is not good in a prolonged game of Magic the Gathering. And many of the games that you lose as a Stompy deck of some kind are those prolonged games. And in those prolonged games, Ancient Tomb keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Planar Nexus enables you to have a large number of soul lands or better that do not necessarily lower your life total. So these are lands that do not get worse as the game goes on. They are going to be a little slower out of the gate, but they are going to be much more reusable. And on an Ancient Tomb start, the Ancient Tomb deck realistically maybe has 12 to 14 life that game, not 20 points of life. And if you get to play a larger number of your games where you are at your full 20 life total, that allows for a little more play with things like the One Ring or Dismembers that otherwise might be very risky. And it allows you to cast more of your bombs. And how many times have you seen play patterns where, like, there's an ancient tomb and your opponent might have days, and there's a lot of tension there about whether or not, like, you're willing to tap an ancient tomb to play around a daze, or if you just want to jam the spell and hope they don't have days. And I think Planar Nexus is going to enable a ton of these land-based strat land strategies, these ramp-based strategies, to have new angles of attack and more consistent long games. Uh, Planar Nexus quietly could be a format-changing card in that, uh, in that a lot of decks that are currently in a lower tier and are like maybe not the most competitive, like might get bumped up a couple of tiers in terms of viability. For example, most of the times that I've played Urza's Workshop on this channel, uh, the Metalcraft has been hard to activate, and if I did, I did not actually make that much mana. But with Planar Nexus now contributing to the Urza count, this card was very real, and I think I had multiple in play that each made four mana or something like that in one of the leagues that I played, and that's kind of silly. And the raw locus count for things like Cloud Post and Glimmer Post has also just gone through the roof. Normally, you really have to rely on Vesuvas to copy these or Thespian Stages to copy these. 
and now you just have those other angles of attack. So expect a little more big mana experimentation moving forward. All right, next up is Glaring Fleshraker and some of the other El assorted Eldrazi card. So I, I thought this card was the bee's knees. I thought this card was going to be very good. And seeing this in practice, it's very good when it works, but there's actually quite a bit of tension in getting this thing into play. And the problem is that if you want this in play early, you're using your artifact mana up to get it into play early, meaning that you don't have that artifact mana in hand to cast after this thing happens. And so, like, when you are in the magical Christmas land of, like, you have this and a Mystic Forge, like, your opponent is probably going to die. But I conceptually viewed this as redundancy for Patchwork Automaton, and that extra mana pip mattered so, so much in terms of powering this out. And this might not actually be the best Eldrazi from the set. While I did body my Eldrazi aggro opponent, I was quite impressed with Eldrazi Linebreaker conceptually. So, at its worst, this is a 3-3 Trampler that the first turn, you know, it comes down. It is at least a 4-3 Trampler with haste. This does require red mana, which is not free, but this is an incredibly powerful effect. And I wonder if you can build a red Eldrazi deck list that has enough red in it to support something like Broadside, where you get to attack with Broadside and your Reality Smasher, hit for seven, throw the five CMC Reality Smasher at your opponent's face for another seven points of damage. Um, this is something that has been kicking around in my head for a few days. And, like, the mana is definitely going to be sketch for it, but it is definitely a hmm sort of idea. And more generally, it's quite possible that a new Eldrazi aggro deck exists that is much lower to the ground. Um, it that heralds the end can greatly reduce the cost of some of these Eldrazi creatures. Um, in thinking about Eye of Ugin, which reduces the... Casting cost by two generic colorless. I don't believe that you get to just like play this for free like you do Eldrazi Mimic. I think they caught that. Um, but like with Eldrazi Mimic and this and the Line Breaker, Thought Not Seer, Reality Smasher, and maybe one more that I'll talk about in a second, like you can have a very respectable Eldrazi aggro deck. Uh, this might be something for a different format. I don't remember which pieces of the Eldrazi deck got banned in modern, but you know. This is one of those things that's in the back of my head currently. Sewing Microspawn was a card that I had very few... Like, I, I did not have high expectations for this card. You know, at four mana, this was pretty slow. But then I cast two of these in back-to-back -back turns for the kicker cost. I destroyed an opponent's land while ramping and creating a 3-3 body that helped stabilize the board. And then I did it again, destroying yet another land, getting another land to my board. And the lands that you are getting here are not basic lands, they are just literally any land. And that means you get to get your Cloud Posts, your Glimmer Posts, your Maze of Iths, your Vesuvas, whatever it is that you need to get. Um, the ability for this to uncounterably, as these are cast triggers, blow up lands and tutor for lands is really good. You know, this is an uncounterable way for you to go and get your Eye of Ugin so that you can go from the mid-range stage of the game into the end game incredibly quickly. Uh, this card was quite impressive. I expect to see a lot of this in green Cloud Post and other ramp decks. I was not impressed by Kozilek's command in my initial testing of the card. Um, Caleb D put out a tweet that was essentially, I don't know why anyone thinks this is remotely playable. And... I'm not quite that low on it, but I'm pretty low on this card and will probably be cutting this from my builds moving forward. So my, my primary issue with the card was that it is an inefficient removal spell attached to a secondary mode that may or may not do anything. So I think I was playing against Brian, 
And I used this as a removal spell that also nuked the graveyard in order to play around things like Murktide Regent that might be coming a little bit later or to stop other recursion. And, you know, if I funnel, let's use a ridiculous number. Let's say I funnel eight mana into this card to kill one creature and exile my opponent's graveyard. Like, is, is that really an eight mana effect? And I think the answer is no. And when I used this card, I was often forced since I was behind, to exile a creature and then make some 0-1 colorless tokens that could either be potential mana for the future or immediate chump blockers. And it, it just didn't feel good. I did not li live any of those dream scenarios where it's like, okay, you know, I exile a merit lage while also scrying a very large number and selecting my next draw. I never got to live a nice dream scenario like that. Um, but un until I see some better results with this card, I, I, I think I'm just cutting this from every deck that I am going to play that has it. Next up is Necro Dominance. Um, th this card is obviously quite good. You know, it is very, very similar to an old busted card, and the new version is still busted. And the question is, how do you best utilize this card? Because I saw this as a mid-range control refuel option, and I saw this as a dedicated combo option. Why don't we start with the combo side of this? If you are playing this as a combo card, you kind of have two options. You activate for a bunch, you sculpt a five card hand that can win the turn, win the next turn, and you pass the turn, or you go off in your end step where you still have a billion D cards in hand. In order to go off at the end step, you probably need something like a Born Upon a Wind or a Leyline Anticipation that lets you cast spells as though they have flash. And Leyline of Anticipation is great if it is in your opening hand, otherwise it is quite slow. Winning with Necrodominance the same turn as you play it is maybe tough, because you have the initial three mana of Necrodominance, plus like two mana for a Born Upon the Wind. Uh, it's a little easier with Leyline of Anticipation, you can go like Dark Ritual, into Necrodominance, into draw a bunch, and then, you know, hopefully hit a Lotus Petal or Chrome Mox or whatever to let you start going off from there. And assuming you go into a Beseech or something like that, it shouldn't actually be all that hard to get a kill. So one thing that I was uh, very initially wary of Necrodominance for was, you know, the whole Orcish Bowmasters is 40% of the metagame dot format. But the thing is, assuming that you have flash from a, a ley line or whatever, with 10 or 15 Orcish Bowmaster triggers on the stack, you can just go off in response. And that was something that was not immediately obvious to me until I started talking with Bryant, and then it was like, oh, yeah, I guess that doesn't actually matter that much. So versus the fair Necro Dominance, Orcish Bowmasters is very good, but versus the unfair, I'm just going to win in response anyway, Orcish Bowmasters is not super relevant. If you are playing this card in a more fair way, in a control way, or a mid-range way, if you do not have a source of life gain, this does put kind of a hard cap on games where you might be sitting there with no ability to draw any more cards and the game is kind of over for you and it's up to you whether or not you are going to concede or make your opponent play it out. You know, if you are at one life, since you don't have a draw step, you just don't get any more cards, period. So that's a little weird. And we got into some very awkward and snaring bridge versus necro dominance board stall games. Uh, especially once Energy Field got involved. So Necrodominance has this bottom clause here. If a card or token would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. And that is just so you can't keep using your graveyard as a resource. But this also just does mean that it is yet another one of these Leyline of the Void, Rest in Peace, Energy Field type cards that has the potential to also be used 
defensively. So you can, in theory, win a game by, you know, playing a necro dominance, getting to the point where you have an energy field in play. You don't draw anymore, so you can literally deck your opponent if, for some reason, they do not have the ability to answer an enchantment. And that is a very weird angle of attack, and one that completely caught me off guard. I think, ultimately, that Necrodominance is better in a unfair shell than in a fair shell. Um, I was very impressed by Exsanguinator Cavalry from Brian's list. Like, Exsanguinator Cavalry plus Necrodominance was quite real. But the necro dominance that you are playing kind of fairly to just draw two or three cards at the cost of giving up your draw steps for the future, I, I like those a lot less. Okay, next up is kind of the modal double faced cards that go into decks like Oops All Spells. I was very, very impressed by how strong. And how consistently the goldfishes for Oops All Spells were with the addition of these extra lands. I pretty much always had the ability to goldfish a turn one. But I think that's where the deck is strong. I think the deck is strong in the goldfish, not necessarily in the actual games themselves. Um, in my games versus Brian, where, you know, I had to fight off, you know, Force of Wills and Surgicals as free turn one interaction uh the deck did not necessarily feel good uh one of those losses was absolutely my fault for boarding out memory's journey uh, i just didn't really know what to cut so i cut the weirdo card and i could have won one of those but i don't know that oops actually gets better in terms of the entire metagame despite it getting a massive boost to its consistency because oops is getting better while one of the best cards ever printed to fight against oops was also printed vexing bobble is a pretty rough thing for oops as this is going to counter not only your artifact mana but also the things that you would like to cast from your graveyard the cabal therapies of the world the uh, dread return that you are going to use to put the thassa's oracle into play uh, so this one is pretty scary as if you want to fight against artifacts using a free spell such as Force of Vigor, this also shuts off your answer to the thing that shuts off the rest of your deck, uh, which is a pretty rough one to punch. You know, Oops can play things that cost mana to take out artifacts. Uh, there's like an evoke creature, I forget the name of, that can do that. But, you know, if you're hoping to use a free spell of some kind, you, you just get noped by Vexing Bobble. And I think Vexing Bobble is going to see a lot of play. Uh, you know, obviously I've talked about that already. So I think a common play pattern is going to be like, Stompy deck plays something that stops Oops in the short term. Oops answers that thing. But then Urza Saga has ticked up and Vexing Bobble is involved as well now. You know. Oops can still, you know, win before this comes into play. Um, but if we start getting blue decks that are, like, playing this backed by Force of Will, uh, uh, good luck. All right, let's talk about Nick Fit a little bit. Let's talk about Flare of Cultivation. Flare of Cultivation was a very, very strange card for me because it warped games in a way that might not have been immediately obvious to you as an observer. So let's talk about Veteran Explorer and control matchups. In a control matchup, Veteran Explorer is often a card that you do not counter on turn one of the game. You let Veteran Explorer resolve, and then your opponent probably can't sacrifice it that turn. So they, like, let's say I'm the Nick Fit player. I pass the turn. My opponent then for one mana casts a Swords of Plowshares, a Prismatic Ending, or another thing that can just exile Veteran Explorer, and they just move on with their lives as if nothing happened. Lair of Cultivation turns Veteran Explorer into a card that has to be countered in a white control matchup. 
because Flare of Cultivation's alternative cost is sacrificing the creature. So, conceptually, Veteran Explorer shifts from a I can let this card hit play, it doesn't matter, to a I have to counter this card or my opponent might get four lands. Three of them to play immediately, one of them to hand. And then the Titanias, the green sons of the world, start coming down immediately. And that is kind of horrifying and a very big conceptual shift. However, on in any hand where you do not have Veteran Explorer, are you happy to have Kodama's Reach or Cultivate in your legacy deck? The answer is probably no, right? So you could be running a deck where Flare of Cultivation is additional interaction or additional threats. And instead, you are making Veteran Explorer significantly better at the cost of other things that are in your deck. And like you can do the math of like, hey, how likely is it that you line up Veteran Explorer and Flare of Cultivation? Um, but it, it's maybe not useful to do the math because like there's there's also like the Cabal therapies, the the Grist, the other ways that you could sacrifice Veteran Explorer. So Flare of Cultivation makes it much, much easier to sacrifice your Veteran Explorer and much easier to get to those higher land drop counts. The question is, like, with Flare of Cultivation in your deck, do you still have enough gas for the end game? And do you still have enough interaction for the early game? Uh, this is sort of an interesting conceptual puzzle. Um, I'm going to admit that, you know, by the time I had recorded my Nick Fit round, uh, I was very tired. I had been recording for many, many hours, far more than I normally do, so I didn't play that last round super great. But I, I think my deck list was a little bit clunky, and I, I think this card ends up being not good, but it's very interesting what it does to the early game versus white control decks. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, first thing that I want to say here is if you enjoyed this today and you want more discussion like this, consider checking out my podcast, The Eternal Glory Podcast. This week's episode will also be kind of first look impressions at these Modern Horizons 3 cards, but with more voices than just my own. Secondly, I want to say that my initial impressions are certainly influenced by the fact that I only played against content creators during this time. So every content creator is out there trying the new cards. You know, we did not spend eight hours recording matches of new card versus Demir scam. And it is possible that some of the cool things that are happening here just don't hold up to, you know, turn one or turn two troll reanimate or turn one double grief you. So just kind of keep that in mind when we get into actual league play, you know, or when we start seeing initial like legacy challenge results, we'll we'll see how much of this stuff actually hangs within the legacy format. In terms of general impressions, I think I am left with a very positive impression of Modern Horizons 3. Some of the cards from previous summer sets ended up being a bit much. Um, some of the things like Orcish Bowmasters and the One Ring from last year were immediately format defining. And some of the other, uh, you know, grief, fury, solitudes of the world had an absolutely massive impact on the format and, you know, are at that like, hey, do these need to be banned in some formats stage? Maybe multiple formats for grief? And it feels like to me that most of the Modern Horizons 3 cards are on the, this is clearly a pushed card, but it's not snapping the format in half. I think Nadu is probably the card that I am most scared of out of the assorted Modern Horizons 3 cards, having seen it in action. Time will, will tell how, how good that deck actually is, and again, how far down the combo versus mid-range line that deck ends up going. 
But generally speaking, I think Modern Horizons 3 has added a lot of sweet tools that are going to empower more decks to be viable, and that's always what I want to see. And, you know, you can come back to a video in this month and, you know, point and laugh at me when, you know, multiple cards end up getting banned or whatever. But generally speaking, initial impressions are good. I am super excited to be recording more content with this. I am recording this video on Monday, June 10th. And in about four days, the cards come to Magic Online, generally speaking. So there will be a few assorted videos that do not feature Modern Horizons 3 cards coming next week. And then everything else from there that I'll be recording will be with the new hot tech. And I am incredibly excited for that. Um, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. See ya!